Oh, thank you very much, Randy. That was a wonderful introduction. Magnificent building. Hard to believe that there was a time when there would be several thousand people in worship just in the Baptist church, let alone the Methodist, the Presbyterian, the Episcopal, the Catholic. Uh, okay, are you all comfortable? You all have a good spot. Madam Lady in charge, are we ready? Yes. Set. Go. Go. All right, my name is uh, Barry Cressman, and I have the great honor on behalf of the Oil Region Alliance of Business, Industry, and uh, Tourism of, um, so to speak, monitoring. The more formal term is, of course, emceeing, master of ceremonying. My wife is an English teacher. She'd probably get me on that one. As I was uh, putting, I, I have, I'm on a time limit, too. I have about five minutes. You tell me, you ring a bell, you know, you know, bell, 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 go, go, go. Okay. It occurred to me as I was putting these remarks together that um, on May the 30th, I will mark exactly the 50th anniversary of my arrival in uh, Northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, specifically in, in Titusville. Uh, I had grown up in what, given the arcane terminology of the state of New York, was referred to as a hamlet on, on Long Island in Nassau County. Some of you may know Oyster Bay, the, the village of Oyster Bay, about to, roughly 32 miles from Midtown Manhattan. Population of about 6,000, a little fish neck, fish neck cove that can't expand. And uh, when I told my dad that I was accepting a position in, in, in Titusville, in Northwestern Pennsylvania, he, he looked at me and he said, um, why are you going to the frontier? <laughs> now, you laugh, that's, that's kind of the New York egotism. You know, we don't suffer from uh, New York egotism. I mean, if you, don't, if you don't live within 50 to 100 miles of New York City, you're, you're nobody, you're, you're, you're nothing. Okay, let me tell you, you already know, if it hadn't been for what happened here, in the latter half of the 19th century, there would be no New York City in the sense that we know New York City today, no Los Angeles in the sense that we know Los Angeles today, no London, Tokyo, Rome, Paris in the sense that we know them today. We call ourselves the valley that changed the world. That, as we know, is more than just a tourist slogan. Am I right? What happened here over a period of roughly 40 years, and we have witness to it just in this church, did change the world. And the Oil Region Alliance of Business, Industry, and Tourism has among its proud obligations that of preserving the, the heritage of this area, building upon that heritage, attracting business and industry to the area, alerting people to the importance of, of this area, luring tourists to this, this area because of its importance as well as its natural beauty. Uh, did any of you happen to read, this is a little digression, I suppose, in the New York Times a number of weeks ago, there was this, this very interesting article, and I'm sure it appeared not just in the New York Times, I'm sure it appeared in Washington Post, whatever. It was uh, written by, uh, it was actually a review of a book written by a psychologist in which he says that the, the, the beauty, the aesthetic pleasantness of the, of the place and the places in which we live tend to make us not only mentally uh, healthier, but also happier, uh, having better feelings about ourselves. Certainly that is part of our mission, and that's really why we're gathered here tonight, because you folks who are in the business of, of preservation, of improving what maybe was once upon a time beautiful and restoring it to its former beauty, or taking something, as is in the case of uh, one whom we'll be honoring tonight, taking something that was destroyed and we wept over it, and returning it to what it had been. That's what we're going to do. This is still a wonderful place to live. Otherwise, my father would have dragged me back to the East Coast. <laughs> 
Funny thing, he came to love Titusville, as did my mother, and they retired here in their old age. David, I'm not going to get to you yet. You'll have your chance. Yes, yes, okay. You presided. <laughs> I am quite amazed. I did. Are you sure? <laughs> David, sit down. I'm in my second childhood. Enough of that. <laughs> Lee, isn't that terrible? You have somebody who knows more about your life than you do. Okay. okay, moving ahead, our first award tonight is the Historic Appreciation Award. The presenters are Alan Montgomery and Melinda Meyer. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. The front, which one? This one? The frontier moves on. I had a job and I was working in Valley Forge outside of Philadelphia in 1979 for the National Park Service. I'd accepted a job up north of Omaha, Nebraska uh, in 1979 with, when I, we went out to a refuge to work with the museum there. And we told our son, who was five at the time, that we were going to leave Valley Forge and move to Nebraska. And he said, I have two questions. And I said, well, what are they? And he said, do they speak English in Nebraska? <laughs> and the second one is, do we have to take our own food? <laughs> so uh, we've, we've gone from Long Island to Titusville and from... from uh, Valley Forge to Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in Nebraska was a nice place to live, too, here. I'll try to get them. Ordinarily, I speak just off the cuff, but I have... Excuse me. Whoa. I have enough things here to read that uh, I wasn't going to trust my memory to that. Uh, we are two former Franklin area residents. We're pleased to be able to present the Oil Region Alliance's new, by the way, Historic Appreciation Award. The Derrick and the News Herald began publishing the Out of the Archives series in February of 2018. The column includes post-1940 photographs of the region with accompanying articles and captions for the pictures. Almost 100 entries were published in 2018 alone, and the series is continuing. So I think most of you here, if you have access to the News Herald or the Derrick, look forward to seeing what the next entry for Out of the Archives is. I saw my neighbor in one. She was a member of the Hospital Auxiliary Board for Franklin, Mrs. James Pankratz. I grew up on for, uh, Chestnut Street on 14th. They lived next door. Bill Pixley, who was in the audience, was one of my neighborhood chums. So 14th Street and Chestnut are well represented. Uh, the series has sparked positive comments and many discussions among the local people. Others who have tried, uh, who have ties to this region also have made comments to these articles. The Derrick and News Herald is receiving this Historic Preservation Award for promoting and celebrating the preservation of history through its column, Out of the Archives. The articles written by Judy Etzel have been widely circulated with some of the following responses. I maintain a list of about 50 people with whom I graduated in 1962 from Franklin High. And when we want to send messages out, I'm the one who sends them out. So I forward, probably illegally, wherever the publisher is, uh, I forward these to these people and they respond. And here are some of the responses to the pictures and the articles that have been out of the archives. And some of these are personal. Uh, okay, this is this real quick. I will always have fond memories of Oil City and love to read the old news and see the old pictures. That's a good warm feeling, believe me. I have been following Judy Etzel's career since she was in high school. This is from Susan in Houston, Texas. 
I follow every article that Judy Etzel has written in the Derrick, especially the Out of the Archives column. They evoke many memories I have of Franklin and Oil City while growing up, and that's from Bill. Thanks, Alan, for the many, many memories. Marilyn from Kansas City, Missouri, uh, thanking me for sending the article to them. I remember crossing that old bridge many, many times as a teenager. Thanks for the memories. Carol from Charlestown, New Hampshire. I saw the pictures of the Exchange Hotel. This, this one came totally out of the blue I, in a letter. I saw the picture of the Exchange Hotel in the paper today. I do remember, she didn't remember the hotel, but she says, I do remember the night the Park Hotel burned, and that was about across from the courthouse there. Uh, we could see the light in the sky from Seneca. I have enjoyed the series of old photos they print in the Derrick. Florence from Deland, Florida. The last one is we had to walk across the bridge from south to the north side, and this is obviously Oil City, with our skirts because we weren't allowed to wear slacks to school. It was very cold in the winter with that wind blowing up from the icy Allegheny River. We were almost frozen when we got to the senior high. Trinity Methodist Church, which was her church, always had a summer potluck picnic at Haston Park. And if you remember, one of recently was the, the article about Haston Park. We children had so much fun playing on the equipment. Then we ate at the pavilion near the entrance. There were games played and awards were given out. This is from Carroll in Mill Creek Township in Erie. To present the new Historic Appreciation Award, my companion here, the other Venango County, former Venango County resident, is Melinda Meyer. Melinda has a BA in History from Penn State, the Barron College, and a Master of Business Administration from Gannon University. As a public historian, she speaks frequently of the history of Erie County. Melinda has experience developing public programming, collecting oral histories, designing and installing exhibits, and publishing. She has also taught undergraduate courses in museum studies and historic preservation. Now get a load of this. Currently, she is on the boards of the Preservation Erie, Preservation Pennsylvania, Erie Yesterday, PA Museums, and serves in the leadership team for the American Association of State and Local Histories Leadership in History Awards Program. Now on top of all of that, she does have a full-time job. And she's a program director for the Erie Arts and Culture. She has worked for the organization since 2009. And in her current position, she administers the Art Council's grants and arts and education programs, among many other duties. In my mind, there are a few people better qualified to present this award for education and preservation. Melinda? Thank you. I, I really appreciate that introduction. I wasn't expecting it to be read in its entirety. Um, so Alan had asked if I would uh, co-present with him and I jumped at the opportunity. Um, he did ask if I would say a few words about preservation, but I'm looking out uh, and if you're here in the room, you are already a fan of preservation. So I, I don't need to speak uh, about the benefits of historic preservation or why it's important. Um, but what I can talk about is the relevance and importance of the Out of the Archives project. Um, because it has kept me connected to my community, um, where I was born and raised. Um, not only does Alan, uh, I happen to be on his listserv, so not only do I get Alan's emails uh, with uh, the Out of the Archives uh, articles, uh, every time I come home to visit my mom and dad, my dad puts in front of me a stack of the Out of the Archives articles so that I can take a look at them. Um, a couple of weeks ago, actually it may be a month now, uh, he put one in front of me that was extra special. Uh, it was featuring a group of men who were working at oil supply. And uh, in the photograph was my grandfather. Uh, he passed away three years ago, uh, and it was just, it was exciting for the family to see that. Uh, and again, these types of projects, um, not only do they 
um, keep us connected to the community, but I think they contribute to, to building a culture of preservation as well. It's not just about, um, it's not just about nostalgia. Uh, it really is about building a community that uh, fully embraces and understands the, the value of our heritage um, that, that is our, in our built environment as well as in our storyscape. Um, and so it is a privilege to stand here with Alan uh, and to present this award tonight uh, to the Derek and the News Herald for Out of the Archives. Come on up here, you too, Judy. Thank you. And do you get to say a few, a few words? Yep. Well, just one thing, I, an awful lot of this, whether it's in living rooms or taverns or wherever, there's a lot of conversation about these photos. And many times the, the people are lamenting the way it used to be. One of my goals to do this was to start the conversation that perhaps we could find the solutions. And I think that it is working. And I, I in opposition to historian Marilyn, please excuse me for this, I really got tired of looking at oil wells on hills. It was just like, oh, please, please, my heritage is more than that. And that's why we started this. And I'm glad that the reception has been good. This is Luca Cronetta, my editor, who would let me do this. <laughs> Thank you. Only thing I'll say is whenever Judy first approached me with this idea, to me it was a no-brainer, in fact, that this would go over very well, only because, well, coming to, you know, mentioning to me, I mean, I'm someone who loves history to begin with, and uh, I thought, wow, this would be fantastic, and, uh, you know, Judy just, she just took this, she took the point from this at the beginning, and she just ran with it, and I could tell every time she's, I walk past her desk and she's going through those folders and those, through those clips and says, well, look at this, isn't, isn't this cool? She got this, she got this, you know this? It's like, you know, then not about a half hour later, I'm finally making my way back to my office, that kind of a thing, so. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just one of the, and I had someone just said to me last week, they said to me, um, you know, I specifically buy the paper, not buy the paper, I'm sorry, she said she has it delivered to her home specifically for the out of the archives and nothing but that. I said, well, don't you like to read the other news? She says, yeah, that's fine, but it's out of the archives I really love, so. <laughs> so she looks forward to it every day, and if there's a day it goes by that we don't have it in the paper, she told me, I'm just really disappointed. You guys gotta get on the stick. And I says, my God, she's, uh, she's, she's on the stick all the time, trust me, so. I'm but anyway. I'm part time, I'm only part time. Yeah, go figure that one out too, so. <laughs> But anyway, um, uh, first of all, when Judy came back to work for us, that was a godsend in and of itself, and uh, this is this is one of the results of it too. So, but uh, but thank you very much for giving us this honor, and uh, please continue to enjoy it, and uh, we'll keep bringing it to you. Actually, Judy will keep bringing it to you. Thank you. Just a brief picture break. Then next will be the award for reconstruction and the presenter is Karen Carey, representing Titusville Renaissance, also the director of the Titusville Chamber of Commerce. Karen. Thank you. I know quite a bit of you in this room, but there are some that I don't know. Um, and I wanted to briefly say, because Barry, you had talked about kind of coming here from out of the area. I came here from out of the area. I am a transplant. I moved here in August of 2006 from the Bay Area in California, a place where I survived the 89 earthquake. And every 10 years or so, everything is new again. 
So we don't have a lot of the beauty that I found here in Franklin and in the oil region, and which is one of the biggest reasons that I still live here almost 13 years later. Um, not to mention the fact that it's a great place to raise my children and a great place to work. And uh, I love all of our hometown festivals and just the warm smiles that I see on the street. I just started at the Titusville Area Chamber in December, and I have been very welcomed there, just like I was welcomed here in Franklin. Um, and I'm just so honored to, to be here to um, help out with this award and to be a part of this group that absolutely um, adores and realizes the value of historic preservation. So thank you um, for the uh, for the invite. Um, so I'm presenting for Missy's Arcade tonight, and I'm so honored to do that, um, mostly because it's my favorite place to have lunch <laughs> in Titusville. Um, the historic building located at 116 Diamond Street started as a saloon in 1871. And speaking of out of the archives, if there's anybody that has some pictures of that. I would love to see that, an old saloon. Um, but it was started in 1871 by a German immigrant brewer named James Honig. Two years later, John Theobald bought it from the Honig brothers and operated it as a restaurant and saloon until 1893. Through the next 27 years, until about 1920, it passed through various hands and eventually became the Arcade Restaurant, owned by Mr. William Schatt. And its advertising listed it as a ladies and gents restaurant, boasting the tagline, seafood, a specialty. Mr. Schatt installed the landmark green sign that remains to this day. During the Great Depression, a series of renovations to the exterior facade gave the eatery the appearance that we see today. The arcade was a local hangout in the 50s and 60s for steel workers, welders, boiler makers, machinists, oil field pumpers and drillers, loggers, sawmill workers, farmhands, merchants, truckers, and other blue collar workers. In 2000, Missy started working at the restaurant. And that very next year, she took over ownership and renovated the entire restaurant with its awesome Coca-Cola and 1950s theme. On February 15th of last year, the building directly next door to Missy's caught fire, and the fire engulfed every last corner of Missy's arcade restaurant. Smoke and water gutted the entire restaurant right down to the studs. Missy walked into her beloved restaurant and found no sign that it ever even existed. You can imagine what she went through at that time. But because of her steadfast determination, she was able to rebuild the entire restaurant from scratch in just four months. And they reopened on June 15th of 2018, and they are running stronger than ever. And I think that's mostly because I eat there every day, probably. I don't know, do you guys run tabs there? We, got, we, got, we have to talk. Maya Angelou once said, you may not be able to control all of the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. So Missy, thank you for your hard work and determination and for providing the city of Titusville one of the very best quintessential restaurants for our families, our colleagues, and our friends to join together over wonderful food and conversation. Thank you. public speaker. Um, I feel really honored to get this and um, um, all I can say is I'm really glad things are back to normal. Um, we're back to business. Everybody needs to come in if you haven't been in to see what we've done there and uh, we hope on going many more years. So thank you for the time.
If you've never eaten at Missy's, it is well worth a trip to Titusville. All right, the next award is for enhancement, and the presenter will be Emily Altamar, representing the Keystone Community Educational Council. Emily? Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to be giving this enhancement award to the Keystone Community Education Council. Uh, the Keystone Community Education Council's mission is to provide educational opportunities, innovative, um, sorry, innovative regional approaches to workforce and economic development for Clarion, Crawford, Mercer, Venango, and the surrounding areas. As a KCEC board member myself, I was pleased to nominate the work done at the KCEC office, which is space that they have rented from the Civic Center-owned transit building in Oil City for the, the better part of the last decade. At the corner of Seneca and Center Streets in Oil City, the transit building has always been a grand example of Victorian architecture with its wonderful details like the sculpted risers on the stairs, the impressive moldings, the high ceilings. But the Keystone Community Education Council's headquarters on the third floor have been lackluster for years, to say the least. So in June of 2018, KCEC Executive Director Lance Hummer set out to do some updating. But it was more than just a simple decorating job. You can see some examples behind me there. Nine areas comprising the majority of the third floor were restored, creating a new small conference room and a classroom in the process. All of the electrical was updated and new lighting was added throughout. Ceilings were returned to their original height, which meant removing retrofitted metal partitions between rooms that were not original, uncovering the tops of arched windows, and returning transoms over doorways to their original heights. The difference it makes is incredible, and when you see the photos, you wonder why anyone would have ever covered up those features in the first place. New carpet and paint went in throughout in colors that were selected to be appropriate to the Victorian look and only wood that had been previously painted was repainted, either white or in a brown that would match the wood stain of the surrounding wood. Also, and probably my favorite part of the project, was the reclaimed architectural salvage from within the building uh, was pulled out from storage in the attic and then used to add Victorian decor in the remodel. So this include quarter sawn oak panels that were once part of the hallways and offices. And they were brought down from the attic and used to create a divider in the wall between the new conference room and the classroom. This is a great example of how salvage is not used for its original intention, but in a new way to incorporate that history and character um, in a new layout, rather than just being lost and covered in dust and cobwebs. And that's part of the point of preservation after all. The whole space is furnished with Victorian appropriate furniture and decor, along with Lance's many collections. The whole place is like a museum and you really should step up there if you've never been. There's so much to look at. The work was completed in October of 2018 and is now a show place of historic design that is comfortable for any meeting, class, or other event. So today we say thank you to Lance and his team for their smart choices and their thoughtful preservation. And we honor you for setting a marvelous example of what a little hard work can do to restore a space. Please join me in congratulating Lance Hummer and the Keystone Community Education Council on this enhancement award. Let's see, I'm gonna shake on it first. Sure. <laughs> Congratulations, thank, thank you. you. Well, Barry, I can say one thing, and that is, I'm not a transplant. <laughs> well, you were a baby when I was a baby. Yeah. The, the one thing that's, I think that it's a love for the history of this area, and that's partly why we wanted to do what we did. Uh, I'm honored to say that I'm part of a seven generation family. I live on the family homestead, which was established in 1834. So my family was here before the oil boom. 
Uh, the other thing is I had family that was extremely interested in the oil industry. And my grandfather back in the 60s had done all kinds of studies and predicted the Marcellus Shale, that at some point in time they would be able to come up with a way of getting it out of the shale layers. So there's a, a lot of history. We have tried very hard, if you haven't been in the transit building, and some of you may not, you really need to come in because there's some very unique aspects about that building. How many knew? that there was a elevator, a cage elevator in that building and supposedly the only other one like it is in the Eiffel Tower. People don't know. Oh, somebody, <laughs> somebody did. <laughs> That's great. There is so much history. Rockefeller was there. A pew. There's a number of them. That That's where the initial exchange occurred. And uh, the office space that we have is where they had blackboards in the hallway and they'd come out and write on the blackboards about the stock and what the stock was going for at the time. So there's incredible amount of history. Oh, by the way, little trivia, how did they run that elevator? Hydraulics. They had a tank of water up on the hill and there was an operator inside the elevator that turned the wheel and the water would raise it and lower it and it would empty back into Oil Creek. So come visit and enjoy the building, but come to the third floor where we've tried very hard to bring it back and that you get a feel, I know there's a number of you who have been there, a feel like you're stepping back a hundred years. The next award is the Adaptive Reuse and Preservation Stewardship Award. The presenter will be Melanie Patterson, representing Titusville Renaissance. Melanie? Hi, everyone. Um, I don't like public speaking, and I'm up here doing public speaking, so I'm going to keep this short. But uh, first, I wanted to give you some background. I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but back in 1998, Bob started a company in his living room, I believe, um, that grew to an international business with 150 employees. And Bob had an idea. He had a vision on a new way to sell salvage vehicles for insurance companies. I'm hoping that Bob has the same vision with Titusville Iron Works because that company that he grew was an amazing place and I had the privilege of working there as their controller um, along with a lot of other people. It was an amazing place to work. He was an amazing boss. And I'm not sure if he's aware of all the skills, experiences, and friendships that were made and that still continue today. So now he's going down a different path. He's got a historic building. And Bob built the build, or bought the building in 2017. It dates back to 1860. And it was one mile and one year away from the Drake well drilling. Um, so it's wonderful to see this vision, Bob, that you have. You are such an asset to our community. And so I'm very happy and proud to give you this award. So if you come forward, please. You're welcome. Oh, yes. And what you should know is that Bob sent all of his employees to Dale Carnegie so they could do public speaking. I'm sorry. I still don't like public speaking, Bob. Oh, you're speaking, great. Bob. You're great. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And I put that money under your chair. Thank you. So. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you for the award. We appreciate it. Um, 
we, like anything that's old, my son and I are big gearheads. So when we first saw the building, we said, boy, this is a great building, old factory, the trusses inside are steel trusses, and the, the entire building was built, I think, in 1894, but David, you can fact check that. Oh, excellent. Uh, so anyhow, the portion we have is the machine, was the machine shop from the Titusville Ironworks. And the trusses the Connecticut Bridge Company put in in 1894, and they're just fabulous trusses on the inside. So we liked the building. We thought, well, let's fix it up. This would be just a really cool building to fix up. But then we later learned, uh, and being gearheads, this was really cool, that in 1895, a group of Titusville guys bought the uh, Titusville Ironworks. And the McKinney brothers were, were uh, one of the parties who had Union Oil, which became South Penn and then Penn's Oil. E.O. Emerson was an investor, and he was the co-founder of Sunoco. And John J. Carter, well, and by the way, all these guys were Titusville residents. John J. Carter um, was an investor, and he had Carter Oil. And if you look in Wikipedia, it says Carter Oil is now Exxon. So some pretty heavy hitters were involved in the ironworks along the way. And then in the 1920, I think the Dillon family bought it, David? And uh, they bought, they owned the Titusville Forge, they bought the ironworks, and they brought, bought Struthers Wells, and then the name became Struthers Wells down the, down the road. So inside, we've kind of paid homage to these guys, and we have actually a, a, a carriage that General Miller used to own. And so we have a little display for General Miller. We have a display for these oil guys, in addition other guys from Titusville that, that were known in the oil business. The, um, um, uh, uh, the guy, Union Oil, David, or Union 70, Stewart, the Stewart brothers that were from Titusville. They struck it big in the Shambaugh fields early, cashed out, and Lyman moved to California, Milton stayed in Titusville, and started Union Oil, which became Unical. And Milton is buried in Titusville Woodlawn. And we have uh, Penn Drake, uh, which started with the American Oil Works across the street from the, uh, from the Iron Works, and then was bought by Penrico and became, uh, uh, kept the name Penn Drake as they went forward. And, um, and several other kind of neat things in there. So we have event, we've had two events, pop-up sales. One was the local businesses came in, set up shop. We have an old Airstream that's a bar, poured beer out of it, or as the local brewer poured beer out of it. We had food, and uh, we had about a dozen vendors that came up, and, uh, and that was a nice weekend. We had live music. And then a month ago, we did an oil um, pop-up sale, and we had several oil vendors that came in selling oil and gas memorabilia. And, uh, and again, it was a two-day event and a nice turnout. So it's kind of a quasi-museum slash event venue. We're always looking to add to it. So if you have any old oil and gas memorabilia to sell, please track us down. And I'm not going to roll out automobiles, any old cars we're in the market for also. So thank you for the award. I appreciate it. And the next event, stop in and see us. Thank you. The next award is an Historical Preservation Stewardship Award, and the presenter, he's already getting up, David Weber, representing the Titusville Historical Society. David? I can add to what Barry already said, and also what Melanie mentioned, that the valley that changed the world does live up to its name. Like Barry said, if it hadn't been for the oil business, New York City wouldn't exist as it does today. Because of the Rockefeller money, we have Rockefeller Center with its Radio City Music Hall and the Rockettes. And Los Angeles wouldn't exist today. And some of you might not be aware of this, but the original, most of the original Beach Boys were grandsons of 
William Quarrel Wilson, known as Buddy Wilson, who was a oil-filled roustabout and boiler setup man in the California oil fields. And he very likely connected the boilers that were built by the Titusville Ironworks. And my mother and dad came to Titusville because of employment at the Ironworks. And there were quite a few other couples that married as a result of employment there. And then when they, they moved into one of their first apartments, their landlord and landlady were natives of Franklin and the father of their landlord, as I said, his picture's back there with the Miller Bible class. And he was related to Joseph Sibley, Charles Miller's brother-in-law. So I, there's a drop of oil in everything, just like Barbara Zolly, who used to be at Drakewell Museum, said. I'm now here to present the award to St. James Memorial Episcopal Church. Titusville's oldest church building in continuous use, and the, cons the congregation was actually partly founded by Colonel Edwin L. Drake, who was a member of the first vestry and one of the first wardens. And over the years, there have been many prominent oil people and prominent Titusville citizens who were members of that parish, including Colonel Edwin L. Drake, George Mowbray, Colonel E. A. L. and Dr. Walter B. Roberts, William C. Warner, James C. McKinney, and Adam Coupler, just to name a few. Church building was built in 1864, 1863 and 64, and over the years it's been renovated and improved quite a few times. In recent years, restoration work has included work on the stained glass dormer windows in the auditorium or nave, restoration of the organ, and cleaning of the outside and exterior stonework. And the stone used to build that church which came from the same quarry as a stone used to build a grocery store building up the street that's still in use. When you look at the stonework of both buildings, it's obvious. And St. James Church is one of Titusville's architectural treasures, and it resembles an old English parish church, something you would associate with the time of Charles Dickens or Robert Browning. It's about as British looking as you can get. And now I can pre present the Oil Region, Oil Heritage Region Historic Preservation Award to St. James Memorial Episcopal Church. Thank you, David. You're welcome, you're welcome. First, I'd like to say our vicar, Martha Ishman, is not present with us today. She's on a three-month sabbatical. She is over in Spain doing a spiritual walk, which is a 300, it's a 500-mile walk, but they've chosen to do a 300-mile walk. And also, while she's in Europe, <clears throat> she'll have time to enjoy and go to British Isles, go to Rome, and do some other things. And I know she's very, very honored and pleased and feels blessed that St. James has been honored with this award. We're very fortunate to be a vital part of the Titusville community. It's our wish and our hope and our dream that not only through the restoration and the beautification of the church, we can grow the church that we can allow the presence of St. James Episcopal Church to be a vital part of the Titusville community for many, many years to come. And I'm pleased to tell you all, we're still working on the restoration of our organ. And we will be having a recital on September 29th. Everybody is welcome. We'll have a little reception afterwards. Our church service will be at 10.30 that morning with our organist, Helen Dale. And we have the honor and the privilege of having Logan Hamilton 
returning to the area. He was our organist when he was in high school. His mother used to have to drive him to church to play the organ. He's finishing up his master's degree out at the University of Washington and waiting to find where he will go next for his PhD. I'm, I'm privileged and honored to be the first female senior warden of St. James Episcopal. It's quite a responsibility. There's lots of things that need to be done. We're, we work as a good team, and anyone who wants to feel the warmth of St. James, please join us any Sunday, 1030. We would love to have you there. Our doors are always welcome to all. And thank you for this honor. In other, in other words, she's following in Colonel Drake's footsteps. The next award is also a Preservation Stewardship Award. The presenter is Sandy Baker, representing the Historic Preservation Association. Sandy? It's kind of a double pleasure for me to be able to do this. First of all, as a representative, um, a board member for Historic Franklin Preservation. I've been on the board now for about 16 years. How it escaped us to have not um, presented St. John's with this beforehand is beyond me. Um, secondly, I have been a member of St. John's Church for about 50 years now, and I have been doing window tours as a docent for probably about 30 or 35 years. Um, St. John's in its current form, our church right now, is the third of three churches that has stood there. Um, the, and again, was oil money that built it. Uh, the current church right now is a rebuild from the 1866 church. Um, and when it burnt in 1900, 1900, it was rebuilt in 1901. Uh, the Tiffany windows were not put into place until about 1904 through 1917. When I started doing window tours back in the late 1980s, um, it was just kind of a happenstance. Um, the church secretary called one day and she was a little panicked because somebody had called and wanted a window tour and at that time we were not doing public window tours. And I kind of threw something together and it went pretty well and a couple of other people at the church expressed an interest in doing it. And we've been plugging along um, in all the years since. Um, the average lifespan of a stained glass window that is properly protected from the elements is about 100 years. And we knew by the late 1980s that um, we were coming up on our 100th anniversary and started doing some research into uh, glass studios and people who knew a lot about them. The project started with our rose window in 1994, and that window was sent to Pittsburgh Stained Glass Studio in North Pittsburgh, and that is where that window and uh, the first set of triptych windows went to. Um, there was a, a bit of a glitch. Um, we had to take a few months to, to re kind of uh, raise some more money. And at that point, uh, the man who we had dealt with a lot named Kirk Weaver, who was a third generation of the founder of Pittsburgh Stained Glass Studio, had left um, his family business and was employed with a stained glass business in Massachusetts. And because we uh, trusted his judgment and his expertise, we ended up sending the rest of the windows to Massachusetts to have them restored. So the last of the windows uh, were restored and put into place in 1999. And um, 
It's been a very interesting experience over the years of the people that we have had come to St. John's to see the windows. Uh, and it is my distinct honor now to make this presentation to our current rector, Mother Elizabeth Yale. a current transplant um, and Sandy here knows way more about uh, St. John's and uh, the stained glass windows than I will ever know um, but it, we were honored uh, last year to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the stained glass windows um, and their uh, restoration and we threw a big party um, and invited the city to come and see um, and we had a bunch of tours and we welcomed lots of people um, and we still do. Sandy does still plug away at the uh, window tours. If you ever like to come by St. John's, um, you can call us to set up a time or you can come by and do the self-guided tour book that we have. Sandy's much more knowledgeable and will answer your questions. Uh, so please stop by St. John's and uh, thank you for this award. Okay, the next award is the Preservation Education Initiative Award, and it will be proffered by Jennifer Burden representing the Oil Region Alliance. Jennifer. Too many things going on at once. <laughs> I am also a transplant. It's been two years now. And I began working at the Oil Region Alliance the beginning of last year and immediately was working with Tony Krasinski on the preservation awards and workshops last year that happened in May. And she helped me through a lot. And as we were looking for sessions for the workshop last year, she said, you know, there's this, there's Juliet, you should really get in contact with her. She's really good, she's an intern here for the past two years, I really like her, and from Tony, we all know that's a very high compliment, I really like her. And she does, she's in the cemetery rest, preservation, and I think you should contact her and maybe we can do a session at the Neiltown Church Cemetery. I said, okay, take Tony's word on everything. So I emailed Juliet, and asked her if she'd be interested in doing a workshop um, during last year's workshops. And of course I emailed her probably in April. And she's like, yeah, I'm interested, but I'm in my last semester of my senior year and I have finals coming up and I'm working on this project and you know, just get back to me in a couple weeks. <laughs> so I did. and. Worked it out, and I think it was probably the next week or two after finals wrapped up that Juliet came out to Pleasantville at, to Neiltown with the help of her mom. Thank you, Heather. And conducted a workshop for the participants that year um, to teach proper preservation techniques of headstones. And I wasn't at that session. I was back um, dealing with other administrative errands of the, the whole workshop and awards. And everyone who came back from that session raved about it and said, wow, that was really interesting. We really learned a lot. Who knew that you know, even I could do something like this? I was like, oh, this is great. And then a couple weeks after that, she started what was supposed to be her third internship at ORA and quickly turned into a full-time position and got to know Juliet really well and she and I hit it off pretty well pretty quickly. And October of last year, she and I attended a workshop in Maryland um, that was co-hosted by the National Park Service where we got to do hands-on resetting 
historic headstones and learning some more about it. And it's like, this is really cool. Like I, if I have a history and preservation background, but never really got to do the hands-on stuff. It's like, yeah, I'm really into this too. And then she led another workshop in October in the Plummer Cemetery, which dazzled everybody because it's amazing that you can instantly see results when you're cleaning headstones and so that's a big key if you can see something right then you got you can get hooked really quickly and after we attended the workshop in in October in Maryland um, we got to know one of the the National Park Service reps and we got to thinking and talking and it's like I wonder if he would come up to the oil region and you know, maybe we can do something big here. And so you know, pencil it in your calendars now, but next year we're hoping to have a two-day workshop led by National Park Service uh, representatives within the oil region on going into in-depth um, techniques of cleaning and maintaining headstones throughout the area. And that's, that's huge for here and really excited to have, to have that in the works. and. This all wouldn't have worked out if it wasn't for Juliet. So I think she's she's definitely encouraged us. Um, and really, just to briefly talk about the the project that she did. And in your program, the website for the cemetery is on there. And I all encourage you to go on there and check it out. Um, I worked in the private sector for several years, and when we came across historic cemeteries. We were never quite sure how to deal with them because they were in various stages of disrepair, um, with a lot of them just being lost to history that nobody knew that they were there, who was even buried there. And we've always, we would always say, we would really need to come up with a website that people can go to because we realize that the descendants of these people who are buried here are probably not in this area, but they probably have some interest and always grappled with how do we make that look. Well, Juliet already answered that question. So if you were around like five years ago, I could have got you a different job. <laughs> Not that I want you to have a different job. Um, so I was amazed that coming from the private sector and we couldn't figure out how to do that efficiently, professionally looking and with all of the information very well organized that she pulled that off as a senior project um, while at Mercyhurst. So I am honored to present this award to you. So you need to come up here and say something. First, I want to say some thank yous. Um, I want to thank the Crawford Heritage Community Foundation um, because without the Ross and Shirley Casella Scholarship, I wouldn't have been able to go to college and I wouldn't be where I am today standing here accepting this award. So I want to thank them first. I also want to thank the Oil Region Alliance for hiring me right out of school. Uh, I was an intern there, as Jen said, for two summers. Um, and then the next summer, they offered me a full-time job. and. Um, I get to be a full-time historian who's paid, so it's an awesome thing. <laughs> and basically, they hired a 22-year-old and gave me keys to the most expensive historic house they own. <laughs> so thank you for the faith that you have in me. <laughs> um, I'm going to be honest with you. I did this project, well, I conceived of this project because I didn't want to write a paper. So, <laughs> so for my public history um, concentration within history, um, we were all required to do either a project or a thesis. And so I wanted to do a project because it was hands-on. It was something that I'd be able to, to do without having to, 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 to write all about it, I guess. Um, and it would be something that's totally different from what I had been doing, because I had been writing all these papers. Um, and so I kind of stumbled across cemeteries um, as a historic, um, historic uh, resource. And um, it's actually my sister's idea, Jessica, to actually clean the stones. Um, and when I mentioned it to my advisor for my senior project, he just sort of looked at me and said, all right, go ahead. And um, so it eventually became 
what you see behind me. Um, so my, my goal was at first just to clean the stones and just to do research on stone cleaning and maybe do a class. Um, and then it turned into a website and it turned into doing research on the people who were buried there and it, it turned into something so much larger. Um, and I'm so grateful to my parents and my sister for helping me out with it. Um, July and August of 2017, we were out in the field. We were scrubbing stones. It was about 90 degrees, humid. Um, we got ticks on us. It, it, was, it was a trip. Um, but we, we did it. We did this amazing historic preservation project together, and I'm grateful for that. Also, don't fill up like a pail with water and then try to drive it down the street, because that's not going to work. We figured that out. Very very quickly. Um, just buy the water, gallons at Walmart. It's perfect. Um, and uh, so I ended up cleaning about 50 gravestones um, in the cemetery, and I now have the website, like Jen said, RidgewayCemetery.org. Um, and you can go on the website and see each of the stones before and after, and you can read about the people. Um, I also have links to census records, links to muster rolls for the veterans. Um, and, I, and it's just become a great resource for people. I've had uh, several people contact me through the website saying they're related to the Ridgeway family. Um, do I have any information? Uh, and they're just thanking me for having that available. Um, and so I just want to say I'm very honored um, and thank you for uh, awarding me this great award. <laughs> Okay, the last award for tonight is the Adaptive Reuse Award. It'll be presented by Kathy Bailey, representing the Oil City Main Street Program. Kathy? Thank you, Dr. Kressman. Uh, my name is Kathy Bailey. I work for the Oil City Main Street Program, and I am very honored to be on staff here at the Oil Region Alliance also. Uh, we would like to recognize the Oil Region Alliance for a project of its own, uh, which is an adaptive reuse project, and it is improvements made to 229 Elm Street in downtown Oil City. This building is located right next to the ORA's uh, main office building. The building was constructed in 1910 as the Salvation Army, and it served as that until 1950, when that organization sold it to a law firm, McFate, McFate, and McFate, um, and then it became those law offices um, for the next 53 years. The Salvation Army moved to a larger facility nearby. Um, so it was used as a law office uh, for many years until that practice closed in 2013. Uh, following Mr. McFate's retirement and eventually his passing. Um, so then it became, this building was right next to the Oil Region Alliance, um, and it was, it was vacant. It was dark and unused. It, it sat unused for three years until the ORA acquired the building um, in August of 2016. Um, so what they did at that time, they started making some improvements to the building, including a facade improvement project um, with the end result being some tenants moving in to the first floor in the, uh, the ground floor space. So what they did on the outside, they repaired a brick planter, uh, reworked the entrance doors, and I have to tell you a story about the doors. Um, they had some amazing wood paneled doors um, on the front. I don't know if we, we have the photos here, but um, those doors were not to code, they were not ADA compliant, and the, the current tenant, which is Senator Scott Hutchinson, had to duck to to get into them, so it just, it really was not um, not working. So those doors were reworked, um, and there were some exterior work also, but eventually, so Senator Scott Hutchinson moved into the first floor, and also the American Red Cross offices moved in. Um, but then in late 2018, they began some renovations to the second floor because of the expansion of their own offices. Um, and so here's where I jump in and, and talk about when John Phillips asked me, uh, 
knowing that I was busting out the seams of my own office. I was in a, a small office managing the, the entire Main Street program out of that, knowing that I needed more elbow room. And he said, Kathy, would you, you know, consider moving next door? And, and of course, I've always liked um, the, the facade of 229 Elm. One of the great features, in addition to the, um, the, the pillars that remind me of turrets and, and the distinctive crosses that are on the front, uh, the windows that are on the front, I, I just love those windows. And so I envisioned having the front office with those great windows that look out onto the street and I thought oh that's great and when he took me up inside to to take me through the space and he said oh no here's where you're going to be um, which is not in that front room um, at the time the the offices were very dated and they seemed kind of dark and a little bit dingy and it, and it was because of the decor at the time it, it was a little bit it was dated and so you know with any move anytime you're moving into a new building you always get a little bit of butterflies gee is this really the right thing uh, you know is this going to work how how is everything going to going to happen. Um, but I can tell you it, it's worked wonderfully. Um, the interior renovations that they did um, included lighting, electrical, plumbing, carpeting, uh, painting, cabinetry. Um, they uh, improved the fire escape at the back of the building. Uh, we had some very slippery metal steps and, and so no, that, those are now coated, um, covered with a treatment and they're, it's slip resist resistant. Um, windows were improved also. And so now we have offices on the second floor that are occupied by ORA staff members, um, the Heritage Department, the Main Street Program, and Arts Oil City. Um, that front office is available for a future tenant. So if you know of anyone who is seeking office space, I can tell you it's, it's a really nice space and it does have a great view. Uh, we want to make a point of saying that ORA took the care uh, to keep various historic features in the building um, and some of those include the interior molding and trim work. Uh, there is a what I think is a really cool vintage metal sink in the second floor kitchen um, but also one of the distinct elements is this really unique yellow and aqua blue tile that is in the second floor restroom. Um, so due to their work though um, with all the, the pains that it went through, the building is now fully occupied and it's returned to active use. Uh, so I am very, uh, very honored and very pleased that I can share space with Marilyn Black and also with Stuart Armstrong. We would like to invite you to an open house in the second floor of that building on Wednesday, June 12th. Um, that is from 3 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and it's simply a time for you to, you can come up and view the office. Now I remind you it's on the second floor. It is a walk up. Uh, so we have a very sturdy handrail, but you do walk up the steps. So, but we were pleased to have you join us if you like. Um, at this time, I would like to say thank you to John Phillips, who's not able to be here today, but also to the ORA board uh, for, for their efforts and their willingness to, to improve that building for us. And I believe that Leah Carter uh, is accepting the award. Neil. Neil is accepting the award. I'm sorry. <laughs> Neil, could I have you come up, please? And I did not. Here we go. It's right here. As I throw things all over. <laughs> Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you Kathy. very much. Yes. This we is appreciate, wonderful. <laughs> appreciate your efforts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do see Kathy when I'm able to get up the steps. I had a hard time getting up those steps without the handrail. And I wouldn't get up them without the handrail. You guys know that. But having said that, um, there's some still we still have some board members here. I noticed a few were here. Barry, of course, is our chairman. Uh, Leah's, are you still here, Leah? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Leah's back there. Betsy. Betsy. Ah, uh, yeah, there's Lee and Maureen. Maureen's on our board. <laughs> Jessica. Lance. 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 I think I mentioned Lance. Uh, anybody else in there from our board that we didn't mention? These are the people who basically shoulder the responsibility for what the Oil Region Alliance does. And the Oil Region Alliance is the administrator of the national, I emphasize, the National Oil Heritage Area. And uh, we're very proud to be doing that, but it's a big responsibility. This project, this project cost a lot of money. And we actually spent more money than was initially budgeted for 
uh, but we tend to do that down at the Oil Region Alliance, and, so, <laughs> and somehow or other we find the money to pay the bills, uh, but that's, that's what it takes. Uh, preservation is, uh, it isn't our middle name, because we have three or four middle names. It's one of those names in the middle somewhere, and it's, it's what we do. We're putting together another management action plan for hopefully another 15 years of being here. And in the middle of all that is preservation, preservation, preservation. We put our money where our mouth was, in this case, in this building, and we're very pleased to be able to do that. So thank you. Thank thank, you. Thanks, Marilyn, too, though. Thank you to Marilyn. <laughs> Okay, well that just about brings this evening's program to a close, but before we do that, I'd like to say thank you, first of all, to all of you who have come. Thank you to the first, uh, I was going to say first Presbyterian, <laughs> the first ba <laughs> shame on me, the first Baptist Church of Franklin for hosting us and their minister, uh, where is he, Randy Powell? Randy, thank you very much, and for the very fine tour, <laughs> for the very fine tour. Thank you very much to the Titusville Historical Society. I think their president is here. Where is he? He left. Okay, for the cookies. And thank you very much to the woman who has put this all together. This is the 22nd Annual Preservation Awards Ceremony. And you get the last word. So, Madam Last Word. But, but, but before that, before that, we'd like to, okay, instructions okay. from the boss. Where is she? Where is she? Where is she? Ah, oh, there she is. <laughs> okay, time out. This is an aside. Marilyn, where are all the award winners supposed to meet to have their group voter taken? After Jen's remarks, right up here. Aha, uh -huh. you all got that. All right. <laughs> Jen, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This was a wonderful turnout. Thank you for coming to celebrate these eight, each unique uh, projects and efforts that have uh, occurred in our oil region. Um, it's a great way to recognize people who maybe you don't see what's going on. Um, you know, Lance's office is in the National Transit Building. Well, if you're not up on the third floor, you may not know that that's going on. With the churches, well, St. James, they clean the stone, and I still hear people say that they've lived there for 50 years and still are shocked when they drive by that that's not the right building, it's too bright. But you may not know inside that the organ's being restored. St. John's here in Franklin, we hear about the windows because they're well, full set of Tiffany windows and that's pretty rare in this country, but just realizing the effort and the cost and the time and the dedication it took and continues to take to keep those windows in pristine condition. So thank you all for coming out and celebrating. Um, as Barry mentioned, this is the 22nd annual, so be on the lookout for the 23rd annual. And you have oh, nine or 10 months to think about projects that you would like to see recognized. So you got some ideas here, but think about in your own area um, what you would like to see recognized and keep a look out early next year for nomination forms. And congratulations once again to all the winners.